Healthcare is perhaps the industry most plagued by the state of them all. There is immense regulation, funding, and in some cases outright state monopolization of the sector. In this video I will show how every major healthcare crisis the world faces today has come about as a direct result of state interference, and I will describe the free market counterfactual for healthcare and how it could solve these problems. You see, Jane lives in the United States, and the United States spends double what other similar countries pay per person on healthcare, but has worse health outcomes. The US is the country that international socialists most often tout as a failure of free market healthcare, despite the fact that the public spending per capita there is more than double that of the UK. Moreover, the US has a greater per capita public funding of healthcare than the total per capita funding of anywhere else, and this is from its previous rate of just $2 a year under the free market. But the immense public funding is not the only problem plaguing the US market. The federal government also places immense regulation, mandatory licensing, and legion other restrictions on the ability of people to freely buy and sell healthcare resources, directly causing the ballooning prices we see today. It is important here to note that this crisis in healthcare didn't fully take off until the mid-1960s, when the government increased demand with the passage of Medicare and Medicaid, whilst continuing the restriction of the supply of doctors and medicine through medical licensing laws, and the regulation of the sale of drugs through the Food and Drug Administration, though the seeds of this crisis were planted far earlier, which I describe later. It has been noted by Milton Friedman that this restriction of supply, coupled with the rising demand, is a direct cause of the price increase above inflation. Robert Alford explained the minority view. The market reformers wish to preserve the control of the individual physician over his practice, over the hospital and over his fees, and they simply wish to open up the medical schools in order to meet their demand for doctors, to give patients more choice among doctors, clinics and hospitals. For more than a century, medical special interests have invested billions into lobbying government to reduce competition. In fact, in 1945, the AMA spent $1.5 million on lobbying, which was, at the time, the most expensive lobbying effort in US history. Their efforts have paid off. Below, I borrow a list of a number of major government policy changes that have interfered with the healthcare industry, compiled by Mike Hawley. In 1910, the physician oligopoly was started during the Republican administration of William Taft, after the American Medical Association lobbied states to strengthen regulation of medical licensure and allow their state AMA offices to oversee the closure or merger of nearly half of medical schools, and also the reduction of class sizes. The states have been subsidising the education of a number of doctors recommended by the AMA since. In 1925, prescription drug monopolies began after the federal government led by Republican President Calvin Coolidge started allowing the patenting of drugs. Drug monopolies have also been prompted by government research and development subsidies targeted to favour pharmaceutical companies. In 1946, institutional provider monopolization began after favoured hospitals received federal subsidies, matching grants and loans, provided under the Hospital Survey and Construction Act passed during the Truman administration. In 1965, nationalisation was started with a government buyer monopoly after the Johnson administration led the passage of Medicare and Medicaid which provided health insurance for the elderly and poor respectively. In 1972, institutional provider monopolization was strengthened after the Nixon administration started restricting the supply of hospitals by requiring federal certificate of need for the construction of medical facilities. In 1984, prescription drug monopolies were strengthened during the Reagan administration after the Drug Price Competition Patent Term Restoration Act permitted the extension of patents beyond 20 years. In 2003, prescription drug monopolies were strengthened during the Bush administration after the Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act provided subsidies to the elderly for drugs. In 2014, nationalisation was strengthened after the Patent Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010, or Obamacare, provided mandates, subsidies and insurance exchanges, and the expansion of Medicaid. This chart shows the cumulative effects of all these interferences on the healthcare spending by sector, and quite clearly paints the picture that the government has ballooned the price far beyond what the market did and would provide. Spending on prescription drugs didn't accelerate until after pharmaceutical companies were strengthened in 1984. Spending has increased even less for administrative, net costs of private health insurance and nursing home care, and not much at all for dental, structures, equipment, public health, other personal and professional care, home health insurance, research, non-prescription drugs and durable medical equipment. Since the 1980s, the government has used its buyer monopoly power through its Medicare and Medicaid programs to effectively set price and quality controls on physicians and hospitals. For the same purpose, the federal and state governments promoted the concentration of private insurance into buyer monopolies. The government has also encouraged clinics and hospitals to respond by merging into concentrated provider monopolies, while continuing to limit the supply of doctors and hospitals. These government-private partnerships, called managed competition, resemble socialist central planning. Government sets prices, which has predictably led to reduced quality, rationing and other perverse gaming. Moreover, the bureaucracy has brought standardised care, higher administrative costs and high executive salaries. Costs in medical care have risen at double the rate of inflation due to these burdens on competition. I don't get it. I mean, we all pay our taxes, right? <sighs> and everyone here is doing their best and you can see it. But there's not enough nurses, there's not enough beds. There's people in the corridors on trolleys been waiting around for hours. No privacy. 
no dignity. I mean, what's happening to this country? The UK's National Health Service, or NHS, has wormed its way so deep into the culture that it achieves an almost cult-like status, where one will be harassed for simply neglecting to cheer for it, and good luck trying to find a single public figure or politician with the balls to say anything even a little bit negative about the monopoly. There is much fury over how the Conservative Party has treated our NHS from leftists, and speaking to one of these international socialists, you would think that they have implemented Thatcher-style obliterations to the funding. But not only has this not occurred, they haven't even frozen the rise in funding. All that anger is over the Conservatives simply reducing the rate at which funding increases. As Anthony Samaroff explains, this increase in state funding of healthcare services has cost Britain its status as a world leader in medicine. Before the National Health Service was created in Great Britain, our nation was a world leader with an unrivaled record in making major medical breakthroughs. People came from all over the globe to study medicine and to be treated in the UK. Dr John Snow proved that the source of cholera epidemics was the water supply in London. Edward Jenner pioneered a vaccine for smallpox in rural England, and Sir Almworth Wright won for typhoid. Sir Humphrey Davy, also a Briton, first suggested the use of nitrous oxide as an anaesthetic in 1800. Sir Joseph Lister pioneered the use of antiseptics in operations in 1865 using impure carbolic acid, saving countless people from dying from infections after surgery. Alexander Fleming, the Scottish physician, discovered penicillin in one of the charitable hospitals in London in 1928. Howard Florey and Ernst Cain brought it to fruition working in a laboratory in Oxford in 1941. Britain has established the best record in the world for achieving major medical advancements and had just developed the landmark drug of the 20th century, as well as playing a leading role in five out of the seven leading medical breakthroughs between 1750 and 1948 when the NHS was established. Britain is no longer a leader in medical advances. Britain has less of the latest equipment, and the old equipment is often being kept beyond the time when it is safe. If a private company was using out-of-date intensive care machines and x-ray machines, obsolete cancer care equipment, and operating tables over 20 years old, double their safe lifespan, the champions of the NHS would no doubt be clamouring for more government oversight and regulation. When government agencies are culpable, they are more or less given a pass on public outrage because they are perceived to be acting in the public interest rather than for profit. The UK is unable to compete with the cancer survival rates of the US. A 2011 report has demonstrated that England's laughable survival rate of 54.48% is eclipsed by the US's 71.18%. Healthcare that is free at the point of service sounds great, but not if it doesn't actually make you healthy. The BBC have reported patients dying in hospital corridors. In one month, 300,000 patients were made to wait in emergency rooms for more than four hours before being seen, with thousands more suffering long waits in ambulances before even being allowed into the emergency room. In the UK and Canada, people die waiting in life for what would be quick and routine medical treatments in the US. In 2017, 4 million people were on hospital waiting lists, up from a 7 year high of 3.4 million, and this in a population of less than 67 million. The number of people waiting for medical treatment in England reached a record high of 4.59 million in January 2021, giving a record high for the second month in a row. In the UK, you could turn up to an emergency room with an appendix about to burst and still be asked to wait overnight before they find you a bed. One patient reported that the lack of treatment rooms led hospital staff to examine her for gynecological problems which had left her in severe pain and bleeding in a busy corridor, in full view of other patients. Such humiliating anecdotes could be dismissed as embarrassing one-offs were it not for the shocking fact that as many as 120 patients per day are being attended to in corridors and waiting rooms, in the public areas of hospitals, and some even dying prematurely as a result. In the first week of 2018, over 97% of NHS trusts in England were reporting levels of overcrowding so severe as to be, quote, unsafe. 25% of British cardiac patients die waiting for treatment, and an investigation by a British newspaper found that delays in treatment for colon and lung cancer patients have been so long that 20% of cases were incurable by the time they finally received care. In 2017, 193,000 NHS patients a month had to wait beyond the target wait time of 18 weeks for surgery, and now nearly 400,000 patients in England alone have been waiting more than a year for routine treatments. According to the OECD, Britain has the lowest number of doctors per thousand population in the advanced world. This chart shows that the US has consistently fewer patients waiting four weeks or more for either specialist appointments or elective surgery than the UK, New Zealand, Australia, France, Norway, Sweden and Canada, seven countries with healthcare systems that receive far less criticism and far more praise from international socialists. Where free at the point of entry resources are limited, older patients are often viewed as a drag on the system, especially since they recur the most frequent care, which costs much more. The average 65-year-old costs the NHS 2.5 times more than the average 30-year-old, 
An 85-year-old costs more than five times as much. Although a third of all diagnosed cancers in the UK are found in patients 75 and older, only 1 in 50 lung cancer patients over 75 receive surgery, and the NHS doesn't even provide cancer screening to patients over the age of 65. Samaroff points out the results of the incentive to manipulate statistics to the detriment of those who most need healthcare. The government can make waiting lists look shorter by denying patients services outright, because those who have been refused services will no longer appear in statistics. If someone's disease proves fatal because they have failed to receive treatment in time, the government figures appear more effective because instead of having to budget for a series of expensive surgeries, they have a deceased person in their hands who will not rack up a whole lot of medical accounts. It's not to say that anyone is perniciously trying to kill off patients, but with the pressure constantly mounting for officials to show meaningful improvements, the incentive to coldly take advantage of manipulated statistics for the greater good of saving the NHS will always loom. It is, after all, our religion. In one interview, prominent columnist Dr. Dal Rimpo reported, managers going around the wards telling doctors who they thought ought to be discharged. They had no medical training or knowledge, but they would try and influence the doctors to discharge patients quickly. This is a problem, of course, whenever the person paying for the care is not the patient himself, but where you have one giant organisation that decides everything, the hazard is greater. So the NHS may not charge one at the point of service, but is immensely costly in terms of both the taxation required and the lives lost. No matter how much money is thrown into the great money but that is the National Health Service, it will never deliver a product anywhere close to being as good as the free market. Big, big booty, what you got a big booty? Big, big booty, what you got a big booty? Big, big booty, what you got a big booty? Big, big booty, what you got a big booty? The Wuhan flu pandemic caused by the CCP virus is currently the most apparent crisis in healthcare. This pandemic started thanks to a lab leak at the Wuhan Institute of Virology where the PLA were conducting gain-of-function coronavirus research. My video detailing proof on that will be out soon. In this section I'll describe how even if we ignore the overwhelming evidence that the CCP created this virus, this pandemic was allowed to progress because of state interference. The Chinese government willfully covered up the severity of the outbreak, threatening doctors who warned their colleagues about the contagion, lying about human-to-human -human transmission through their who mouthpieces, and refusing to provide virus samples to researchers. This was all during the largest migration of the year, that being the Chinese New Year, making these measures appear to be deliberate attempts to infect other countries. In addition, the proposed precursor virus, Rati G13, was destroyed by China, leaving no samples for foreign researchers to investigate. The virology establishment, especially in China, have been running cover for this horrendous event, leading to the deaths of over 3 million people. In an email correspondence with Anthony Fauci, Dr. Christian G. Anderson of Scripps Research, head author of the main source used to debunk a lab origin, said that some of the features of the virus look, quote, engineered, and that, after discussions earlier today, Eddie, Bob, Mike, and myself all find the genome inconsistent with expectations from evolutionary theory, where Eddie, Bob, and Mike are all his co-authors on that paper. None of this makes it into the paper though, and shortly after this two-faced opinion on the virus came out, Anderson deleted his Twitter account in shame. Take a six dollars tablet for that, and I take it for two years. Streptomycin, and that's two grand. Ten grand, cure one person. According to the CDC, tuberculosis infection is treatable, and if caught early, doctors can prevent progression to tuberculosis disease. But even if the illness has progressed to that point, it can still be treated with greater effort. The CDC recommends three drugs for the treatment of latent TB infection. Isoniazid, rifampatine, and rifampin. These medications may be used on their own or in combination, as needs dictate. When TB infection progresses to TB disease, the treatment options are slightly different. Isoniazid, rifampin, ethambutol, or pyrazinamide. So to treat TB in its different stages, you need one or multiple of isoniazid, rifampatine, rifampin, ethambutol, or pyrazinamide. So let's see what restrictions the state places on each of those. The synthesis of isoniazid was first described in 1912, and three separate pharma companies attempted to patent the drug at the same time. Luckily, none succeeded. The patents of the drug itself aren't the only way drugs are restricted. INH suffers from inflated costs, making it infeasible for use in poor nations where treatment is most needed. And where the drug isn't monopolised under IP, the process to produce it, it often is. Rifampatine was patented by Renato Criccio and Vito Aroli under US 4002752A. The production of rifampin under US 4174320A. Similarly with ethambutol and pyrazinamide. And of course, our old friend Isoniazid. 80 years ago, Americans were also told their nation was facing a healthcare crisis. Back then, the complaint was that medical costs were too low and that health insurance was too accessible. But in that era too, government stepped forward to solve the problem 
and boy did they solve it. So if socialist healthcare has caused every major crisis we see today, what might the free market counterfactual for healthcare look like? We have a historical precedent that we may draw upon, that of a lodge practice performed by fraternal societies from the late 1800s up until the death of the lodge in the 60s. Fraternal societies, which arose from earlier friendly societies in the UK, were mutual aid organisations that provided a number of services, mainly focused on covering for what the later welfare state would provide, but at a much higher quality and entirely voluntarily. As a spokesman for the modern Woodman of America once wrote in 1934, they provided a few dollars given here, a small sum there to help a stricken member back on his feet or keep his protection in force during a crisis in his financial affairs, a sick neighbour's wheat harvested, his grain hauled to market, his winter's fuel cut, or a home built to replace one destroyed by a midnight fire. Thus fraternity has been at work among a million members in 14,000 camps. Lodge practice was a system where a fraternal society would hire a doctor on a retainer to provide care to its members as and when they needed it. Doctors would bid fiercely for these contracts, possibly for the assurance of a regular wage, and this bidding calls for an extremely low price by modern standards, as historian David T. Beto explains. The leading beneficiary of lodge practice was, of course, the patient of modest means. He or she was able to obtain a physician's care for about $2 a year, roughly equivalent to a day's wage for a labourer. For comparable amounts, some lodges extend coverage to family members. The remuneration the lodge doctor received was a far cry from the higher fees schedules favoured by the profession. The local medical society in Meadville, Pennsylvania was typical in setting the following minimum fees for its members. One dollar per physical examination, surgical dressing and daytime house call, and two dollars per nighttime house call. Such charges, at least for ongoing service, were beyond the reach of many lower income Americans. Hence, it was not coincidental, an editorial in the Medical Council pointed out, that lodge practice thrived in communities populated by the working poor. Moreover, had it not been for the competition offered by fraternal societies, official fees would probably have been higher still. In this vein, Dr. Charles S. Sheldon complained that lodge practice demoralises the scale of prices in a profession already too poorly paid. It causes dissatisfaction among those outside the lodges and makes them unwilling to pay regular prices. I don't know why any of us should want to pay a regular price that is higher than what the market produced. And if those outside of lodges are unhappy with their regular care and unwilling to pay those high prices, perhaps they ought to join a lodge. Furthermore, this phenomenally low price did not come at the cost of quality either, as Beto later elaborates. Inspection of the medical journals gives some cause for scepticism of blanket assertions that lodges heedlessly sacrifice quality to elect candidates with the lowest fee. The contrary, in fact, occurred in a campaign described by a lodge practice adversary, Dr. George S. Matthews of Providence, Rhode Island. In one lodge meeting, two members in good standing in the state medical society openly underbid one another. One volunteered his services at $2 a head, the other dropped his price to $1.75. The first bidder then acceded to this price with medicines furnished. This occasioned a drop in bidder number two in his price to include medicine and minor surgery. To the vast credit of the lodge, neither bid was accepted, but a non-bidder was given the job at $2. In another case, a moose lodge asked the national organisation to increase the salary of a doctor deemed particularly deserving. Doctors who were too arrogant and ineffective to serve the poor for such a cheap price were, of course, outraged by this. We already have a taste of this seeping through in the above quote, where a doctor declares that his price is the regular price and that his more efficient colleagues were pricing at a rate that sullies the dignity of the profession. This is very much in the same vein of those who complain about predatory pricing. See my video on monopolies for my response to such claims. But it goes further. There is seemingly a disgust from some physicians towards the idea of serving those beneath them. Shortly after the turn of the century, articles about the lodge practice evil began to fill the pages of American medical journals. The most serious opposition to fraternal societies, without a doubt, was the organised opposition of physicians. The spread of the lodge practice evil elicited nearly universal condemnation from state-run medical societies, reflecting the intensity of the feeling the Pennsylvania Medical Journal bluntly demanded in 1904 that the club doctor must be shut out of the profession. At its core, this antipathy represented fear for the survival of fee-for-service remuneration. Dr. W. S. Z. Rath of Sheboygan, Wisconsin, succinctly summed up the matter when he chided one of his colleagues for bowing to the keen business instinct of the laity, who had discovered in contract practice a scheme to obtain medical services for practically nothing. Once doctors allowed non-professionals to place them on fixed salaries, Z. Rath and others cautioned, loss of both income and independence would follow. The profession would then become tainted and demoralised by every physician's undignified scramble to sell himself to the lowest bidder. Another opponent predicted that lodge practice, if not stopped, would depress fees to levels comparable to those of the bootblack and the peanut vendor. 
No problem was off limits in depictions of the Lodge Doctor. He was a scab who broke ranks with professional solidarity, an incompetent quack spewed out by a low-grade diploma mill, and most unforgivably, a huckster bent on commercialising the noble art of medicine. Critics were quick to add, however, that Lodge practice also harmed the patient who, in return for these low fees, received shabby service. It was a vain attempt to charge one opponent to get something for nothing. Another cited the consensus of opinion that physicians generally gave fraternal organisations their money's worth, no more. But as I have shown above, the low prices of the Lodge did not, in fact, come at the cost of quality, with Lodges not just opting for the lowest bidder, but the bidder who would provide their members with the best service. In any case, Beto continues. Dr. John B. Donaldson of Canningsburg, Pennsylvania spoke for many. As to Lodge practice, to my mind it is simply contemptible, and I see no excuse for its existence. The double standard did not escape the attention of Lodges. An editorial in the Eagle magazine claimed, with some exaggeration, that there were few professional protests against company doctors. Does it make a difference, it asked, whether the employer of contract doctors is a wealthy corporation or a fraternity of humble citizens, most of them wage earners? By the 1920s, Lodge practice had entered a steep decline from which it never recovered. Large segments of the medical profession had launched an all-out war throughout the country state societies imposed manifold sanctions against physicians who accepted lodge contracts. The medical societies of several states, including Pennsylvania, Michigan, California, Maine, and Vermont, recommended that offenders be barred from membership. The evil is such a far-reaching one, warned the Journal of the Michigan State Medical Society, that any measures to suppress it are justifiable. Other state professional organizations, such as those of West Virginia and Illinois, favored less draconian pressure on practitioners to sign pledges spurning lodge contracts. It was, however, county rather than state societies that formed the vanguard of the movement to suppress lodge practice. Note, the author means state in the sense of the United States of America. These societies were, and still are, granted special coercive powers by the government. The prototypical campaign began with the request that a doctor sign an agreement shunning lodge contracts or at least not provide services for fees under the customary rate. Sometimes this method worked, at least for a while. If the pariah failed to relent, he faced more serious retribution, such as forfeiture of membership or a boycott. In 1913, for example, members of the Medical Society in Port Jervis, New York, vowed that if any physician took a lodge contract, they would refuse to consult with him or assist him in any way or in any emergency whatsoever. Sometimes the boycotts were extended to patients. One method of enforcement was to pressure hospitals to close their doors to members of the Guilty Lodge. By 1914, in the Journal of the American Medical Association, Dr. Robert Allen could write, but with slight exaggeration, there is scarcely a city in the country in which medical societies have not issued edicts against members who accept contracts for lodge practice. Reports in the medical journal suggest that these restrictions were effective. One example occurred in Bristol, Pennsylvania, where local physicians boycotted the lone lodge doctor in the area. As word of the campaign spread, patrons gradually withdrew from him, his calls for attendance were few, and this last summer he quietly left the town and its vicinity. In a similar case, a member of the Loyal Order of Moose in Fort Dodge, Iowa, charged that doctors in his community had run the local lodge into the ground by going on strike. This organised assault on lodge practice coincided with the rise of the welfare state, which served to crowd out the lodge. After all, if you're being forced to pay for welfare by the state, how likely are you also to pay for mutual aid? Do you support Obamacare or the Affordable Care Act? I support Obamacare. So if you were a senator and you could vote today, you would vote to keep Obamacare instead of the Affordable Care Act? Yes. So let's now take a closer look at exactly what state healthcare looks like, keeping the free market counterfactual in our minds. We are told by Bernie Sanders and other Democrats that the Affordable Care Act, known as ACA or Obamacare, saves 36,000 lives a year, and that its repeal would therefore be equivalent to the signing of 36,000 death warrants. But as economist Orrin Cass and historian Tom Woods have pointed out, the best statistical estimate for the number of lives saved each year by the ACA is zero. In fact, there is reason to believe that Obamacare cost lives rather than saved them, as Cass shows. Had mortality continued to decline during ACA implementation in 2014 and 2015, at the same rate as during the 2000-2013 period, 80,000 fewer Americans would have died in 2015 alone. It is true that some studies find that health insurance does indeed save lives, but those studies are dealing with private insurance. Obamacare, by contrast, has, by and large, been an expansion of Medicaid, with the share of Americans holding private insurance actually declining. This encouragement of state insurance plans caused by Obamacare and similar acts has had deleterious effects. Any randomised trial in Oregon that gave some individuals Medicaid whilst leaving others uninsured, recipients of Medicaid gained no statistically significant improvement in physical health after two years compared to the uninsured. What's more is that researchers have found that Medicaid patients with a variety of conditions and medical needs often experience worse outcomes than similar uninsured patients. 
In the early 20th century, health insurance was hardly used. At the time, available treatments were limited, so the market for insurance was largely underdeveloped. Some people did acquire sickness insurance, but this was more intended to maintain income during times of illness than it was to pay for one's medical costs, which were cheap enough to pay out of pocket, as described above. Programs comparable to modern health insurance started to gain steam during the 1930s, but really began to pick up in the next two decades when government policies made them artificially attractive. When the United States entered World War II, businesses on the home front found it difficult to attract the labour they needed because the draft had taken 11 million Americans out of the workforce, in addition to the federal government imposing wage and price controls. This regulation, like all others, had negative effects that the short-sighted bureaucrats could not see coming. They made it illegal for businesses to attract additional labour by offering higher wages, ostensibly in order to control wartime inflation. Businesses found a way around this restriction, however, in the form of employer-supplied medical insurance. The authorities didn't consider this benefit to be a wage increase, thus making it exempt from the taxation applied to regular wages. This is the origin of what became the tax exemption for employer-provided medical care. After the war ended, labour unions began to bake employer-financed medical insurance into their contract demands. Non-union employers likewise felt compelled to provide it, in the hope that they could thereby avoid the unionisation of their workplaces. Here again, we see the role of non-market forces in bringing about the present reliance on employer-supplied medical insurance, the special legal privileges labour unions enjoy, and the lengths to which employers are willing to go in trying to preserve a free labour market in their corner of the economy, derived from the statutory interventions into the free market, and are not part of the market itself. The establishment of healthcare as a company-offered benefit may seem innocuous enough, but as a result, medical care became an expense Americans paid for only minimally out of pocket. People became accustomed to having most costs covered by a third party, and so slowly but surely, they came to disregard price altogether when evaluating medical products and services. If employers are paying health costs for their employees through an insurance company, those employees will be less mindful of costs than if they bore it themselves. Likewise, suppliers of healthcare have an incentive to offer high-cost treatments with marginal benefits because someone else is picking up the bill, and this someone else is incentivized to go for these overpriced solutions as they can then deduct more from taxes and the other wages. If the employer covers $1,000 of medical bills, they can attract more employees than if they only covered $100. The employer wants as much of the wage to be insured as possible due to its tax-deductible status. The predictable result, since neither suppliers nor consumers have an incentive to keep costs down, has been ongoing price increases. Naturally, businesses tend to push back when their costs rise, but for privacy reasons, they find it more difficult to pry into the merits of a particular medical procedure performed on an employee than, say, to uncover why that employee purchased a first-class plane ticket on the company credit card. VJ Boyapati, a former Google engineer, tells a story that could be multiplied millions of times over regarding the effect on price when perverse incentives, and then normal ones, are in place. He wanted to have a small cyst removed from his back. This is what happened. The first practice I visited was a dermatologist's office, which deals primarily with insured customers and can afford to charge exorbitant rates. I explained to the assistant on my first consulting visit that I didn't have health insurance, I chose not to, and I asked how much the procedure would cost if I paid cash. She quoted me $700 for a riskless procedure that takes about 15 to 20 minutes to perform, and would not in this instance be performed by the dermatologist, but by the assistant herself. As I explained to the students in the public health policy class, the fact that there are very basic procedures that cost the equivalent of $2,100 an hour is a glaring sign that the market's normal price mechanism has been broken. On the recommendation of a friend, I decided to visit another medical practice, Country Doctor, which deals mostly with lower income patients who do not have health insurance. Because its customers pay out of pocket, Country Doctor doctor has a much stronger incentive to charge prices that its customers are willing to pay up front. When I had the procedure to remove the cyst on a country doctor, it was performed by an actual doctor and it cost less than $50. Medicare and Medicaid, created in 1965, are also examples of third-party payment. Medicaid, the means-tested program for the poor, and Medicare, a program to provide for the medical costs of the old, regardless of income, both artificially stimulated demand for medical services on the part of the consumers, who were not themselves bearing the costs. In 1960, government covered 21% of total medical expenses expenditures, with consumers being 55%. At the start of the millennium, governments covered 43% and consumers only 17%. By 2019, governments made up for 85% of all healthcare expenditure. Naturally, costs rose dramatically under these conditions. Notably, in the year prior to the establishment of Medicaid, poor families had higher hospital admission rates than did those in wealthy brackets. And while higher income individuals had an average of 5.1 doctor visits per year, low income individuals had 4.3 hardly a dramatic difference. What Medicaid did result in was a dramatic decline in the reduced cost or pro bono services that doctors had once provided to the poor as a matter of routine. 
According to historian Alan Matuso, most of the government's medical payments on behalf of the poor compensated doctors and hospitals for services once rendered free of charge or at reduced prices. Medicare Medicaid, then, primarily transferred income from middle-class taxpayers to middle-class healthcare professionals. Employers should be free to offer their workers a choice between continuing to receive employer-provided medical insurance or instead receiving the tax-free cash equivalent of the present average cost of such insurance, say $10,000 to $15,000 indexed for inflation. This change would make clear to employees that the money an employer pays for their medical insurance comes out of their own pockets in the form of lower salaries. Right now, most workers doubtless consider their fringe benefits to be free. If the employee chooses the tax-free income, he would then have a much greater incentive to carry only a high deductible policy. That is, since he can pocket any money he doesn't spend on his policy, he has an incentive to keep that policy inexpensive. High deductible policies, in turn, make people more cost conscious, since more of their medical expenses come out of their own pockets. And under this arrangement, the typical worker would save more than enough to pay for the full deductible on whatever insurance policy he may choose to purchase, should he even need that much medical attention in a year with money to spare. Given the ongoing rise in medical costs and the countless stories of personal hardship to which these costs have given rise, critics of the present system have oft claimed that additional government involvement is necessary. But if earlier government interventions have tended to push prices up, Additional interventions in the same direction are likely to intensify, not solve, the problem. The Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises once described how government intervention tends to feed on itself. The first intervention causes problems, that further interventions are enacted to solve, and so on ad infinitum, until the economy becomes a maze of regulation and control. Never considered is the mere repeal of the initial problematic interventions. Now, firms with 50 or more employees will be fine if they do not offer workers a health insurance plan that meets with the federal government's approval. Quite some distance we have travelled from insurance being a World War II tax write-off. Author Jacob Hornberger recalls growing up in Laredo, Texas in the 1950s, at a time when the Census Bureau had labelled that city the poorest in the country on a per capita income basis. Yet according to Hornberger, I never knew of one single doctor who turned people away. They treated everyone who came into their office. I never heard of a doctor complaining about having to provide free services to the poor. And how were doctors doing in those days? They are among the wealthiest people in town. The money they made from the middle class and the wealthy, and the poor who could pay, subsidised patients who couldn't pay. Those who received free care were grateful to receive it, and typically brought the doctor in-kind gifts. When government got involved, an impossible regulatory ticket invaded uncomplicated medicine to the point that physicians began retiring early, having come to despise a profession that they'd once loved. Meanwhile, among patients a sense of entitlement began to supplant the normal human instinct of gratitude. What had once been a harmonious and mutually satisfying relationship became frustrating for everyone. The very fact that people today, so long accustomed to government-provided medical care, would actually wonder what would happen to the poor under a system without government coercion shows, as Hornberger says, what America's welfare state has done to people's faith in themselves, in others, and in a free society. In the United States, sectors of the healthcare industry that aren't generally covered by insurance have seen dramatic decreases in price along with great innovation. As John Stossel has reported, Alternative are able to provide an online eye test that is as good or sometimes better than in-person tests, but for half the price. As a result, the American Optometric Association have cried out for regulation, having persuaded 13 states to draft bills banning at-home eye tests. They want to force consumers to go to eye doctors in order that their pockets may be lined. Laser eye surgery generally isn't covered, but as a result, one optometrist reports, we have to provide excellent quality services to be competitive. If his patients don't like the service provided, they will leave and go to a different doctor. If he doesn't have the best equipment, his patients would notice and they would leave. He has also been incentivized to make the experience as enjoyable as possible, reducing wait times and keeping people entertained as they wait. Quality improves whilst prices drop. Cosmetic surgery, another uninsured area, sees similar improvements, with costs falling relative to inflation. As John Goodman, founder of the National Center for Policy Analysis, puts it, this price drop is, despite a huge increase in volume and considerable technological innovation, which is blamed for increasing costs for every other type of surgery. Can continue on your parents' insurance until 26, that's still in there. Requiring insurers to cover pre-existing conditions, check, still in there. Preventing insurers from setting lifetime limits, check, still in there. Tax credits so people can afford healthcare, check, still in there. Covering the people on Medicaid today, it is in there. I borrow the following list of regulations on the US healthcare market from Jargon and his contemporaries on the Liberty HQ forums. He explains that the two main ways that the healthcare market is distorted today is through the use of restrictions and subsidies. Restriction 1. Illegality of cross-state insurance purchases. Consumers are prohibited from reaching across state lines to purchase their health insurance. This narrows the selection available to consumers, reducing competition and thereby allowing for a worse service in each state. Restriction 2. Insurance alternatives are regulated. 
In addition to the regulation of insurance, the main competitor to insurance, Lodge Practice, was destroyed by those who had formed the AMA, as I described above. Restriction 3. Licensure of Medicine Doctors, clinics, hospitals and insurance providers must become licensed by local, state or federal government in order to provide care. Doctors are licensed by the American Medical Association and granted scope of practice privileges by states. Hospitals and clinics are licensed by municipalities, and insurance providers are licensed by state governments. The essential function of licensure, in this case, is to exclude would-be providers. Licensure has capital and credential requirements, which exclude providers which are lower quality and lower cost. For example, a would-be doctor who may not have attended a prestigious medical academy, but could diagnose common disease nevertheless, is excluded. In addition to this, hospitals require certificates of need in order to start construction, which are handed out by municipal or state planning boards, headed up by local medical experts who run their own hospitals, creating an obvious conflict of interest. Restriction 4. Unionism in Medicine Medicine is a unionised industry. Nurses and other random hospital personnel through their unions demand that certain processes be made impossible unless under the supervision of a unionised worker. This means that jobs which require only the labour of one person become jobs that require the labour of six people. The hospital and ultimately the taxpayer then has to pay for said extra labour. This also raises the barrier to entry for possible competing clinics if they can't provide certain services without hiring unnecessary workers. Restriction 5. Patents Patenting is when a government gives an inventor a monopoly over an idea. Said inventor may then punish others should they try and use the same idea using only their own private property. This limits the amount of providers per innovative idea to one. Some might say that patents are a necessary carrot to the proverbial horse for spurring innovation. Intellectual property lawyer Stephen Kinsella disagrees, saying that empirical evidence suggests that patenting actually has a depressing effect on innovation. Patenting in the medical industry leads to needlessly expensive medical goods, namely machinery and pharmaceuticals. Restriction 6. The Food and Drug Administration the FDA is an organisation which screens products for safety and quality before giving them the green light for sale and consumption. It has also been captured by agribusiness corporations since its very inception. It slows the release of new medicines, prohibits people from trying alternatives, and occasionally seizes property and privilege only to confer it to a state-blessed enterprise. This discretionary authority, especially when seized by monopolistic interest, leads to slowed innovation, fewer products available, and product markups as large as 37 times. Restriction 7. Medicare and Medicaid Price Fixing The Medicare and Medicaid program set the minimum reimbursement rates, which companies then use as a baseline. This system encourages you to go on an insurance plan. Physicians offer lower prices to clients with insurance to try and attract business, and then charge higher prices to other clients in order to make up for said insurance discount. This means then that those without insurance, who can probably least afford care, end up paying the most for it. Without price fixing for procedures and treatments, there would be no general minimum charge and physicians wouldn't have to discount insurance companies to attract clients. Restriction 8. Paperwork Extraneous paperwork in general is a restriction on business. It imposes controls on entrepreneurs that bureaucrats deem necessary. It raises the costs of a business, as entrepreneurs are forced to comply with regulations. They must also employ lawyers and pencil pushers to sort through the red tape. This disadvantages smaller businesses, as they aren't politically connected enough to avoid regulation and are also more sensitive to high costs than are large businesses. Moreover, paperwork slants markets in favour of well-established businesses. Subsidy 1. Institutional tilt towards insurance when everyone is encouraged to go on a health insurance plan, everything is encouraged, and even employers are encouraged to provide health insurance. The consumer's function as a discriminator and cost cutter is quantitatively altered. Instead of economising and considering every purchase of medicine, the care seeker will simply ask for help and sign the bill. Caregivers, acknowledging this, will sell high cost options primarily and not suffer for it, seeing as the care seeker's treatment is being covered by his insurance company. What happens over time when consumers do not seek the best bang for their buck is that both treatments and insurance rates will go up. Subsidy 2 Mandatory coverage of specific conditions Insurance companies are compelled by law to offer coverage to certain treatments in all of their policies. This benefits the person with said medical condition to the disadvantage of all others. All are forced to pay for the now higher rate due to the increment of risk added by adding mandatory extra coverage, whether they want to be covered for said condition or not. If person A has a certain condition, it is not the responsibility of the next person to subsidise the treatment of person A. Insurance plans become homogenised and unnecessarily expensive. This encourages people to not avoid certain conditions such as obesity or heart disease. Subsidy 3. Aid to hospitals in equipment Hospitals receive aid for having the latest and greatest high-tech equipment. This encourages hospitals to spend too much money on expensive equipment, partly paid for by taxpayers. And since the hospitals aren't buying the equipment because of legitimate need, but because of political incentive, they are not discriminating buyers. Thus, we can expect that the suppliers of medical equipment will raise prices comfortably without fearing that hospitals will stop buying. Subsidy 4. Aid to hospitals and patients the government will pay for a share of a patient's hospital bill if it is sufficiently huge. Since hospitals are non-competitive, they will respond by ratcheting up the hospital bill to get federal money. Citizens, in the aggregate of their tax forms and ER bills, end up paying twice as much. Subsidy 5. Aid to employers 
The federal tax code encourages employers to provide their employees with health insurance. Some might say this is great, but it is not. Employers offer that health insurance out of your wages, and as the insurance they pay for is massively inflated in price and allow for no customization, it causes huge problems. Firstly, it programs you to clutch your job like a lifeline, whereas if you inquired insurance independently, you could go where you wanted. If you value independence and self-respect, that's problematic. This also disables the consumer choice mechanism. No one will leave their job just to get a different healthcare plan. Secondly, it puts everyone on bloated insurance plans, which leads to the problems described above. Subsidy 6. Inflation Since much of the deficit is financed out of open market operations issued by the Fed, Medicare and Medicaid are about half of the deficit. A sizable chunk of all printed money goes into government spending in healthcare. This means that the government's buying activity in healthcare drives the prices up, and those not on the government healthcare teat will have to pay higher prices, not having had the privilege of paying yesterday's low prices with tomorrow's new money. They will have the pain of paying tomorrow's high prices with yesterday's old money. As the deficit gets worse, more debt will have to be monetized, and there will be more inflation in healthcare, meaning healthcare isn't getting any cheaper. This we would call an absolute king. Hans Hermann Hoppe is an Austro-Libertarian economist known predominantly for his work on covenant communities and argumentation ethics, though my focus here will be on his lesser-known stance on how to solve healthcare in the US. Step 1. Revoke all state-mandated licensing requirements for medical schools, hospitals, pharmacies, doctors and other medical personnel. In doing this, Hoppe argues, the supply of these services would almost instantly increase. This increase in supply would lead to lower prices, a greater variety of healthcare, and increased competition leading to increased innovation. Competing voluntary accreditation agencies can more than fill the role that is taken up by mandatory state licenses. If a healthcare provider believes that such accreditation will increase their reputation and allow for greater trust leading to more customers, then they will seek this out and be willing to pay for their privilege willingly rather than having it be forced. In addition to these benefits, Hoppe points out that the consumers, now without the belief in a single national standard for healthcare, would increase their search costs and be more discriminating in their choices thereby sidestepping the proposed market failure. Step 2. Revoke all government restrictions on the production and sale of pharmaceutical products and medical devices. This would mean an immediate dismantling of the FDA, eliminating its hindrance to innovation and the increased costs it causes. In step with the following costs would be a reduction of prices and consumers acting in accordance with their own personal risk assessments rather than that forced upon them by the state. Competing drug and device manufacturers would, in order to protect against liability suits and to attract customers, provide increasingly better product descriptions and guarantees. Step 3. Deregulate the healthcare industry Hoppe's gripe with the current statist insurance is that it is forced to insure that which, in a free market, is uninsurable. As an example, you can profitably insure people against painting their own wall blue, as this would be entirely within their own power. Moreover, the standard for whether something is insurable is whether it is outside the insured party's control. Applying this to healthcare, many medical maladies that are currently insured arise as a result of actions of the insured. Those risks that an individual is able to systematically influence the likelihood of fall within that person's responsibility and cannot be shared with others. All insurance, moreover, involves the pooling of individual risks. It implies that insurers will pay more to some than others, but that nobody knows in advance who will get more and who will get less. The winners and losers are distributed randomly, and the resulting income redistribution is unsystematic. If winners or losers could be systematically predicted, losers would not want to pool their risk with winners, but with other losers, because this would lower their insurance costs. I would not want to pull my personal accident risk with those of professional football players, for instance, but exclusively with those people in circumstances similar to my own, at lower costs. Because of legal restrictions on the health insurer's right of refusal to exclude any individual risk as uninsurable, the present health insurance system is only partly concerned with insurance. The industry cannot discriminate freely among different groups' risks. As a result, health insurers cover a magnitude of uninsurable risks, alongside and pooled with genuine insurance risks. They do not discriminate among various groups of people which pose significantly different insurance risks. The industry thus runs a system of income redistribution, benefiting irresponsible actors in high-risk groups at the expense of responsible individuals and low-risk groups. Accordingly, the industry's prices are high and ballooning. Tom Woods explains the problem with the current state-mandated insurance structure. Insurers are required to 1. Enroll everyone who applies, known as guaranteed issue, 2. Cover pre-existing conditions, and 3. Adopt a policy known as community rating, in which they must charge the same price to all, with minor exceptions for geographical area, age, and whether the plan covers an individual or a family, and insurance companies are regulated in how large the difference can be between, say, the very young and very old customers. The elderly whose medical bills are far higher and of far greater quantity than those of the young may be charged only a premium twice as high. It therefore makes sense for people to not purchase health insurance, wait until they become ill, and then purchase an insurance plan, their current illness being a pre-existing condition that insurance companies would be required to cover. This is a suicidal business model, or perhaps homicidal, as the insurance companies did not elect to impose it on themselves. No insurance company can survive without being allowed to pool risks appropriately and charge premiums based on relevant actuarial estimates. 
profit-seeking insurance companies cannot operate according to a business model designed for a social welfare agency funded by taxation. Requiring insurance companies to cover pre-existing conditions, moreover, is like demanding that homeowners be able to take out fire insurance on a burning building. Cynics suspect that advocates of this plan understand perfectly well the impossible burden it will place on insurance companies. The boogeymen who we are supposed to hate, who are in fact earning a mere 2.2 cents on the dollar in profit, and must be intelligent enough to foresee the coming collapse, and, as night follows day, nationalisation of the insurance industry. To deregulate the industry means to restore it to the unrestricted freedom of contract, to allow a health insurance to offer any contract whatsoever, to include or exclude any risk and to discriminate among any groups of individuals. Uninsured risks would lose coverage, the variety of insurance policies for the remaining coverage would increase, and price differentials would reflect genuine insurance risks. On average, prices would dramatically fall, and the reform would restore individual responsibility in healthcare. Step 4. Eliminate all subsidies to the sick or unhealthy. Subsidies create more of whatever is being subsidised. This is why there are so many single black mothers, because single parenthood was, and still is, subsidised. Similarly, subsidies for the ill and diseased promote carelessness, indignance and dependency. If we eliminate such subsidies, we would strengthen the will to live healthy lives and to work for a living. In the first instance, that means abolishing Medicare and Medicaid. Thank you for watching. This video has been a massive undertaking, so remember to like and subscribe. If you have any questions or arguments, leave them in the comments below, but save them elsewhere too as my comment section often loses comments and I don't know why. I aim to have the CCP virus video done soon, but as university is starting soon and I have a job, it may be slow going. Thank you for your patience, and I will see you next time.